to these guys, what are they doing? Anybody know what they're doing? Looks like they're digging a ditch, but they're not. They're digging the dirt and they're leaving a ditch. What they're actually doing there. <laughs> <laughs> this, is a, this is a place called uh, this is a place called Kubaracha, believe it or not. It really is Kubaracha. Kubaracha. The Kubaracha slide. Um, this is Panama Canal. Uh, Haynes was on the commissions of both the Isthmian Canal project and the Nicaragua Canal project. So they're in dueling uh, proposals. And Haynes argued for the uh, Isthmian or Panama Canal. Uh, and in addition to that, he successfully argued that once they decided on Panama, which was not a popular choice, Nicaragua was a more popular choice, uh, uh, but once they decided on Panama, uh, the decision then was, do we dig down far enough for this canal to be sea level, or we put in a system of locks? And Haynes said locks made more sense. And they actually went with that. That doesn't mean that he made the decision to do that. He was, he was just one of the uh, engineers that argued for that, and persuasively argued for that. Okay, so he's promoted to Brigadier General uh, U.S. Army on 4-21-1903 and retired at age 64 on July 6, 1904. But in 1916, an act of Congress made him a major general on the retired list. What does that mean? means he gets a major general's pension instead of a brigadier general, which is a good deal and, and quite a quite an honor, but I don't know how many retired brigadier generals uh, that affected. I don't know if there was more than just him. Um, in July of 1907, though, interestingly enough, he's been retired here three years, he sued the U.S. government for $5,090 because he said that while he was serving here on these commissions at the behest of the, the president, he was offered uh, command of the Department of the Gulf. And the fact that he couldn't take that because the president said, no, you got to do this. Although, I don't know how that works, because even the president command, uh, the, the commander in chief. Uh, since he couldn't do that, he lost, he says, 5090 bucks, and he wanted it. I do not know the disposition of that lawsuit. I just know he did it. So that was a pretty good career spanning uh, uh, how many years was that? I mean, counting how long he was in uh, uh, how long he was in the academy it would have been over 40 years. 46 years. So did he win the lawsuit? I, I don't know what the disposition is. I couldn't find any record of the disposition of the lawsuit. But it was cool enough that he did it. So, uh, I mean, if you want to lose a whole day or more, just uh, go to the New York Times archive online, and your day is shot. <laughs> Start throwing things in that search engine, and, and you're gonna you're done. And before him. Um, so that's a pretty good career, but he wasn't finished because on September 18th. 1917, at the age of 77, he was returned to active duty in charge of the Norfolk District. Did I say it right? Norfolk. Is that right? It depends on where I am in Virginia as to whether or not I'm right. <laughs> I try to say it kind of dirty, because I think that's the way they like to say it. I don't know. Same with that county uh, that, I, that I read is Falk here. Some people say it different. Uh, <laughs> If I was in Virginia, I wouldn't put any names like that. I wouldn't name any towns anything like that because you guys, your minds are in the gutter. And you <laughs> so he, he's returned to duty uh, as a US, in the U.S. Engineer Department there in, in that district. And after that, he was Division Engineer of the Eastern Division. And his final, final retirement was September 2nd, 1918. There he is. Have a distinguished looking fellow. The very picture of a modern <laughs> He died at Walter Reed Hospital in Washington on November 21st, 1921, at the age of 81. Haynes has lived a long time. 81 back then was pretty good. Um, 
1864, I'm sorry, this is his, uh, his tombstone at, um, in the very crowded Ames plot at uh, Arlington. There was his wife, Virginia Pettis Jenkins Ames. Well, I lived him. I lived him by two, uh, eight years, although uh, she was younger than me. Oh, no, she was the same age, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. I said, I'll, I'll tell you why I said that. I thought that. But in, uh, in 1864, Haynes married Virginia Jenkins, daughter of, you know, any Navy people here? You know, Navy, like Civil War Navy buffs? One. You're that guy. You're the same guy that comes to my website. <laughs> the one guy that comes to my website is also the uh, Navy. Uh, and you know who that guy is? Can you tell me what he is? He's a rear admiral. Uh, his daughter, Virginia Jenkins, uh, was uh, Peter Haynes' wife, who he married in 1864. This is uh, rear admiral after, after the war, uh, Thornton Jenkins. He served in the war with Mexico and was an admiral, David Farragut's chief of staff at the time of Mobile uh, Bay, and uh, among other prominent assignments during the Civil War. Uh, they had three sons, not him, but Peter and uh, um, Virginia had three sons. But uh, the interesting thing about him is he was in control of the uh, uh, lighthouse board after the war. Very <laughs> Well, I mean, he, he, he did it pre uh, preemptively because it, he did it in 1864, so right. he had a lot of foresight. Uh, he thought he was going to be building lighthouses later for this guy. Uh, but Virginia and Peter had three sons, so let's keep them straight. I don't have photos of them here. He had a son, John Powers Haynes, born in 1865, who died in 1964. Graduated from the U.S. Military Academy in 1889, and he had achieved the rank of Colonel, the U.S. Army. He had another son, Thornton Jenkins, named for this fellow, Haynes. Uh, he was born in 1866. He lived to 1953. He was uh, not a military man. He was the author of seafaring novels. So whenever I hear that, who do I think of? What do you think of when you hear the author of seafaring novels? William Henry Gaynor. Maybe. Herman Melville. Yeah, you know, you know, the ladies think of? The ghost of Mrs. Muir, right? Because the captain wrote Blood and Foam for Lucia so she wouldn't have to marry Uncle Ned. Remember? Seafaring novels, that's what he wrote. His, his, one of his most famous ones was called uh, The Black Bark, B-A-R-Q-U-E, which is a three-masted vessel. Somebody came up afterwards and told me what, and he told me about the, I don't know what they're called. They're, they're some, some seafaring thing. <laughs> but I, I don't Glad know. we cleared that up. It's the name. <laughs> it, it's almost as, as meaningless to me as the cavalry. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, he wrote a lot of these. He, he wrote a total, I think, of uh, fifteen. Let's see. He published twelve books under his own name from 1894 to 1908. After that, he wrote under another name. Um, and one of those names he wrote under was Captain Maine Clue Garnett. In 1912, May of 1912, um, a magazine uh, called The Popular Magazine, uh, May 1st, 1912 edition, hit the stands with one of his stories in it called The White Ghost of Disaster. It was about an ocean liner, strikes an iceberg in the Atlantic and sinks. The RMS Titanic sank on April 15th. So this is one of the big uh, uh, <coughs> uh, mysteries of the Titanic. You'll find on a lot of Titanic websites. They'll talk about the White Coast of Disaster. Uh, it hit the stands on May 1st. So when did that magazine come out? When was it finished? When was it typeset? I don't know for sure. But it sounds kind of hinky to me because... Um, it described an ocean liner 800 feet long. Titanic was 882 feet long. Sailing through smooth seas at 22 knots, Titanic <coughs> exact speed when it struck uh, the iceberg. Um, despite, it was sailing at that speed, despite the conviction of the second officer whose name happened to be Mr. Smith. 
You got any Titanic nuts in there? Sound familiar? Uh, his conviction that there was ice amidst the fog. Lookout saw an iceberg too late. The liner plunged headlong into it. The panic among the salves of passengers. Officers and, and crew tried to maintain discipline. Captain returns to the chart room while the ship sinks, retrieves his revolver, and shoots himself in that story. In 1891, TJ, that's what I'm going to call him now, TJ Thornton Jenkins Haynes, he killed his friend Edward Hannigan while boating in Hampton Roads, Virginia. He pled self-defense. He was acquitted despite the eyewitness testimony of a retired admiral that it had not been self-defense. Had not been self-defense. He had another son, Peter Conover Haynes Jr., who we'll call Jr. Uh, he was born in 1872 and I have no idea when he died. Find any record, but he is buried in Arlington. Graduated from U.S. Naval Academy in 1893, uh, but on June 7th, which was the day of his graduation, he was uh, declared uh, he was physically disqualified and discharged. Um, and looking into it a little further, there were other people uh, that had not graduated yet that were also physically disqualified, um, and it had to do with the number of available officers' billets in the Navy at the time. Uh, at least that was the story in the newspaper. So after that, he, he goes to Johns Hopkins University. Don't know if he graduated from there, but uh, at one point he was considered to be the most educated man in the U.S. Army because in 1890, 1898, he applied for commission in the Coast Artillery Corps, and his commission as a second lieutenant was signed by President McKinley. So he got into the Coast Artillery and uh, so there he is in the U.S. Army. Um, grandson Peter Conover Haynes III, who was Peter Conover Haynes Jr.'s son, although you don't necessarily have to be the son of Junior to be the third, but he was, uh, lived from, uh, two, uh, eight, from 1901 to 1998. He was a Major General, U.S. Army, World War II in Korea. He was a member of the 1926 Olympic pentathlon team and the 1932 equestrian team. Great-grandson, Peter Conover Haynes IV, graduated from U.S. Military Academy in 1952 and obtained the rank of Colonel. And great-great-grandson, John Tower Haynes, graduated from the Academy in 1983. As of 1999, he was a major, but I haven't been able to find him since then. I'm sure there's an easy way to do it, but I just have to figure it out. Okay, at Bull Run, what did Haynes do at Bull Run? Because that's how I suckered you all into it. Well, he, in, in, uh, in 1911, August 1911, he wrote an article in the Cosmopolitan magazine entitled, uh, The First Gun at Bull Run. And it starts off, a fine crop, a fine crop, Mr. Secretary. These were the words with which Abraham Lincoln greeted us greeted us that memorable 25th of June. All right, so I'm one sentence in, and I already got to check it out. Can't find that in Lincoln Day by Day, but there is uh, a, a book called uh, uh, West Point in the 60s, I think it's called, that was written by a classmate of Haynes, and he also mentions meeting uh, Lincoln when they got to Washington, D.C. These were the words of the Greek with which Abraham Lincoln greeted us at that, that, that memorable 25th of June, 1861, the day after we had arrived at the Capitol from West Point. As you know, when they graduate from West Point, they all go down to New York, they got to buy uniforms, they get their pictures taken. You know, the, 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 the famous picture of Pelham, you know, that he had taken in New York and, and was, was found in a lot of his uh, friends' descendants' uh, possessions. Uh, can't find any evidence that... Uh, Haynes took one, but, but uh, Custer took one. I mean, most of them took one. And they usually party pretty hard, and, and then they go to their assignment. In this case, most of them went to Washington, D.C. 